I created a program called Healed Being for the Emotionally Abusive Person That Wants to Change. But the program is so much more than that when it comes to showing up as the best version of yourself in a relationship. If you're working on stopping being the difficult person in your relationships, head over to HealedBeing.com and give yourself and others a chance to experience the best version of you there can be. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani and I want to help you learn the skills you need to deal with life's challenges in the most emotionally intelligent way. This show consists of my personal opinions and is meant for informational purposes only. Always seek a professional for your mental health and well-being. I am so glad that you are here. Thank you for joining me for another week of The Overwhelmed Brain after, let's see, this is almost November, after almost nine years of doing this show. I am happy to be doing my ninth year and I hope to continue doing this another nine years and maybe longer. I may have said this before, but I told my girlfriend that uh, on my deathbed, <laughs> someday, way in the future, I hope, uh, I will record my last show. That sounds creepy when I say I know it's it's morbid when I say that, but that's what I think about, I guess, <laughs> when I have free time. I think about what I'm going to be doing when uh, I can't get around, I'm I'm no longer mobile. I'm failing in different ways. And uh, I thought, well, wouldn't that be great to have my last show right before? I mean, I don't even want to talk about it. That's that's really probably disgusting, and I'm sorry. But um, I think I said that because it fascinates me, like um, life fascinates me, just like what happens when you die or when you're dying. And again, it's a morbid topic, and hopefully I'll never bring it up again. <laughs> but if I do, I apologize. But I think it would be interesting to have the final thoughts. You know, it's it's one of those, what would you do differently now that you're dying kind of thoughts. That's a great thought to have when you're prepared for it. When, when you want to reflect on this stuff, if you want to meditate on this, what would I do differently if I knew I was going to die tomorrow? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, max out the credit cards. <laughs> it's not nice, I know. But I think about all the stuff that I wanted to do or maybe wanted to buy, experiences I wanted to have. And that's why I like that kind of thought process, reflecting on what you could have done differently, what you should have done differently, what you wanted to do but never did. This reminds me of a, um, a book I read. I remember they were talking about suicide when people feel the need to take their own life, which I hope you don't. I used to have feelings when I was in my 20s of just ending it, didn't want to deal with life anymore. It was too hard and people were too difficult and love was painful. And um, I think I read it. I forget where I read, I read it, but they said in the book that if you're planning on doing that, again, I hope that's not you, but if it is, if you're planning on doing that, then do everything that you've wanted to do. Experience life to the fullest. Get it out of your system. And maybe not even that, just experience things that you've never experienced. Do things that you've never done. You may have to max out your credit card. I'm not saying that's a good idea again, but when you experience things, what ends up happening is that you become more, I don't want to say worldly, but it sort of is because when we feel like we're depressed or we can't express ourselves or we feel oppressed by someone else or different people or the society we're in, it can really be helpful to remember that we're in a box. I mean, we're all in boxes. We all have our selection of friends. We go to the same places often. We see the same people. If we go to work, 
We see those people on a daily basis. If we're in a relationship, we see that person. We see family. We see all these people, all these um, our circles, you know, our circles of influence. And when we have a lot of negative influence or not enough healthy or positive influence in our lives, or we have some old trauma that we haven't resolved or expressed, what ends up happening sometimes is that it overwhelms us. And we don't want to take that overwhelm with us, so we have thoughts. We have these thoughts and feelings, and we just think it would be easier to end it and get off this planet or go to heaven or just wink out, whatever your belief is. And when you have these thoughts, it often clouds the rest of your thoughts that could be healthier. And when you are clouded, you usually don't think clearly anyway. If you're not thinking clearly, then it's hard to have healthier, happier, more positive thoughts because you're so clouded. And when you're clouded, you may not think, hey, I'm going to go max out my credit card. I'm going to go take a class or climb a mountain. I'm going to do something with my life. I'm going to do something that makes me feel good because I haven't felt good in a long time and have an experience that I have never experienced. And maybe you've felt held back. Maybe you've not been allowed to experience this. And when you allow yourself to experience things, usually it opens up your mind. Usually it takes you out of the box that you're familiar with and opens up a whole new world. Like I remember way back, maybe 12 years ago, I met this woman that worked at the bank and she said, I've never left this town. It was a small town in Washington. And she said, I never left this town. And I was surprised. I said, really? You just, you, you never go anywhere? She goes, no, I'll probably be here for the rest of my life. And she wasn't that old. She wasn't like retiring or settling. She just said, I'll, I'll never leave this town. This is all I know. And I said, that's really strange to me. And I, I wasn't putting her down, but it's really strange to me because I was traveling for work and I saw many places. I mean, I didn't travel outside the U.S., but I saw many states and it opened me up. Like if you ever go to a department store, if you go to the same department store over and over again, they only buy inventory that's probably the most popular, that has a good price point, but you never see any other inventory there that might be like different or unique or original because you're used to going to the same department store over and over again. But when you travel to a unique store or a different store in a different area of town or a different state, you start finding out that there are other products and other things that you've never seen that uh, really pique your interest. Like I went to a, a grocery store and I found the pickles <laughs> that I've been looking for and I didn't know they were there and they were cheaper. I never go to this particular grocery store and I was surprised. I found those pickles. I love pickles and that's that's what I was looking for and they were like three bucks cheaper. So I said, this is where I'm going to get my pickles. I would never have known about it had I not traveled outside my box. And this is what can be helpful in your life is that if you're not traveling outside your box, then you may feel oppressed, repressed. You may feel stifled and you could feel depressed. And depression can lead to thoughts that might lead to some other thoughts that make you think it would be better not to be here. When there are experiences and people and places that you've not yet seen, that you've not, not yet experienced, and what happens is you are limited to the four corners or the four walls and I guess ceiling and floor of your box. And if that's the only experience you have inside your box, you're not going to think that there's anything better out there. If you are depressed, if you are having bad thoughts, then that's what's going to happen is that you're only going to see what you see because you're limited inside your own little world. And if you don't get that kind of exposure outside your box, then you don't know there's more out there. This is very similar to a uh, romantic relationship where the person you're with, you think they're the one. You think that person is the one that I'm going to be with forever and ever. And then they turn out to be a jerk. <laughs> they turn out to be emotionally abusive. They turn out to be hurtful. But you think they're so wonderful. 
when they're wonderful. They're so great when they're great. And so you don't necessarily give yourself an opportunity to look beyond this relationship for anyone else because you think that they fulfill all your criteria. You think that they are the one that the only one they can make you happy. And so you stay with them, even though they make you sad, they make you angry, they confuse you, they make you feel bad. When you're with somebody and all of your energy is tied up with them and you don't think that anyone else can do that for you, you will you know, sometimes stick with that person. Sometimes you'll leave, but some people will stick with a person like that. And because of that, they won't see outside of their box. And so their world is very small in the sense that that's all they know. Eight billion plus, maybe nine by now, people on the planet. And this one person is the only one that fulfills all your criteria, even though they're hurtful and uh, a pain in the butt (laughs) to be with sometimes. So this is what happens is that the relationship can run its course and you could be disappointed, you could be sad, you could be angry, but you don't leave because you think they fulfill all this criteria, but you don't know there's more out there. You don't know there's other people out there that will make you feel even more worthy, even more lovable, even more attractive, even more feeling good inside yourself. And because you are already committed to the relationship and you're not willing to give that up, you know, I'm talking about a a difficult or not fun relationship that isn't working out, then you may not think that anybody else out there will do what they did for you, the good stuff at least. And so this is what happens is we get stuck in this pattern of thinking, stuck in our ruts. And when we're in our rut, we don't know what else is out there. And all I'm trying to say is that when you confine yourself to a world that has what you know in it and you're comfortable in that world and you don't expand your world, like when I was traveling, I was able to expand my world and see what else was out there and experience things and bring novelty to my brain to enhance it, to expand it, to know that there was more out there because when I went back home, I'm in my box again. When you're in your box and you don't know what else is out there, you may not ever get out of your box. So the inside the box thinking versus the outside the box thinking, to get outside that box, you have to go further than you're maybe comfortable with. You have to expand your horizons. You have to do things that you didn't, you wouldn't necessarily do. If you've never played pool at a pool hall, go play pool. See what happens. Maybe you'll meet people. Maybe you'll have fun. If you've never done kayaking, you know, do things that expand who you are. Because we get into routines. We are so used to patterns. We are so used to doing the same thing or the same things a lot throughout the week, throughout the months. And sometimes we feel like that's all we can do. Well, that's all I can do. I I have to work. I have to come home. I have to clean. Maybe take care of the kids. Maybe make dinner. And then I go to bed and I start it all over again the next day. That is difficult. I get it. I've been there and I'm still there. (laughs) But I still have to take the time uh, not only to expand my mind. I mean, it's not only about going out and seeing the world or meeting new people or doing new things. It's also about grounding yourself. It's about grounding yourself in a way that you connect with who you are at the deepest level. Because there's nothing better than learning who you are so that you can heal anything that needs healing or expand anything that needs expanding. Because when you ground, what I mean by that is that you are connecting with yourself in a way that nothing else is an influence to you. And what that means, that could mean anything to a lot of people. It could mean meditation for you. It could mean sitting outside. It could mean listening to music. I know when I listen to music, especially emotionally charged music, you know, the kind of music that charges me, I will feel connected to myself almost like I'm accessing many emotions at once. And when you can connect with yourself and access emotions that are in there, and help yourself get them out 
to be expressed through tears, through thoughts, through ideas, and also through actions. You know, if you've ever had a thought that led to an action, which we all have, (laughs) but if you've ever had a thought that led to some life-changing thing in your life, you know what I mean. It's sort of like, after I saw the movie The Matrix, I was interested in martial arts. So I took a few years of it, and I enjoyed it. And then I stopped, because uh, that was (laughs) all-encompassing. When you do something like that, it can be all-encompassing. It changes your life, and I wanted to do more with my life. And so I, I moved past that, but I, I did other things too. I expanded what I wanted to experience in my life so I could expand who I am and who I was and all that. But the reason I'm saying all this is because after having been in a depressed state in my 20s and having these thoughts, these suicidal thoughts, these depressing thoughts, I decided to change it up. I decided to do more with my life, even though I wasn't feeling like doing anything with my life, but I wanted to do more because maybe I was missing something. I don't think I was thinking this way back then, but maybe I was missing something that I could do to enhance my life or change the status quo. The status quo is what we do every day. It's our routines. How do we change the status quo? We got to do something differently. Like I read another book that said, uh, sometimes you have to exhaust yourself. Sometimes you have to exhaust yourself to the point where you're so uncomfortable that uh, you stop thinking about what you were doing. I don't think the book said this. I think this is what I got from the book. And what that means to me, for example, is let's just say that you climb a mountain until you're so exhausted you can't climb anymore. What do you do? Well, you're so exhausted that you are essentially connecting with a deeper part of yourself. This is like working out too, or anything that exhausts you. When you're so exhausted, you get to connect with a part of you that maybe you're not used to connecting or don't know how to connect to. But when you do, what ends up happening is that you end up focused on different things. I mean, it turns into survival pretty much, but let's just say that you were depressed. If you were depressed and then you exhaust yourself, You're no longer thinking about what it takes to stop being depressed or thinking about that void of depression. You're not in that space because you're so damn exhausted. And what that does is take your mind off what it was on. And that is another way to expand your mind is to get yourself to the point of exhaustion doing something. And that's not the only way. I'm not saying that you should just automatically go climb a mountain, or work out until you just can't handle it anymore. It's about uh, reaching a threshold inside yourself because your threshold is your box. That is the top wall. That is your ceiling. And as you climb that ladder or those stairs and you finally get to that ceiling, you can't push through to see the outside world, to see what else is out there. What happens if you continue trying to push and you exhaust yourself to the point that you can't push anymore, what happens is that your priorities change. And you are no longer thinking about what you used to think about. In fact, you may stop thinking about trying to get out of the box in this example. I don't want to get out of this box anymore. I don't care. Getting to the point of not caring what happens next can be liberating. Because you're no longer trying to achieve something You're letting go. You're releasing it. You're allowing it to be no matter what. And I I talk about uh, reaching the threshold when I talk about emotionally abusive relationships. I tell the um, victims that you're going to reach a point where you just don't care about trying anymore. You just don't care what they do or what they say because you're done. That is the threshold. And I tell the uh, perpetrators of emotional abuse, I help them over at healedbeing.com. I try to help them see that if they've reached, you know, the victim of emotional abuse, if they've reached threshold, then um, you really can't bring them back. Their threshold is their breaking point. You can't bring them back. They have to come back on their own. They have to come back themselves. And if there's still love in their heart, 
Maybe they will if you are healing. The abuser has to heal themselves. They have to stop the behavior. They have to stop doing things that are hurtful and harmful. And they have to start focusing on themselves and working on themselves and figuring out why they do this stuff, their emotional triggers, their coping mechanism. And when they figure it out and they stop the behavior, it gives the other person, the victim of emotional abuse, a chance to heal and see the person, the perpetrator, as different and changing. But the victim has to see that happen for themselves. The perpetrator can't convince the victim that they're changing. The victim has to see it for themselves and they have to have the freedom to choose to see it or not because threshold pushes someone over the edge and no amount of convincing will tell them anything. It won't convince them of anything because they've heard it all before. And I could go way into a rabbit hole with emotional abusive relationships, but when someone reaches threshold, when you reach threshold, you're done. And when you're done, you usually let go of what you are trying to accomplish. If you are trying to climb that mountain and you're exhausted and you don't want to climb anymore, you're done. You're going to turn around and go back down. The greatest part about this is that you finally get a new perspective. You finally break beyond the barrier that was holding you back. You finally rip out of the box and get to the point where you prioritize differently, you see things differently. You've reached the point where what used to matter doesn't matter as much. And I mean the negative stuff. Like if you had money issues and you are in a boat that's sinking, you don't have money issues. <laughs> You're in a different space in that moment. You are in a life or death, death situation and money issues don't matter because you are at the threshold. You are at reprioritizing what's most important in your life. And I come back to, you know, come full circle here. I'll come back to what would you think? What would you do? How would you feel? What are your thought processes when you think about tomorrow not being here? Again, this is just a mental exercise, not a contemplation of suicide or hurting yourself. Certainly, you want to talk to somebody about that. If you are in that space, definitely talk to somebody. There's a suicide hotline. There's a suicide chat line. I don't want you to go down that road until you've experienced everything there is to experience. At least try to reach for everything that you can. And this is only for certain people listening now. Some people aren't going to relate to this because they're not depressed, they're not suicidal. But I think there's a lesson in here for all of us because uh, I get sad, I get depressed, not clinically, I'm not saying that, but there are times where I get anxious and uh, there are times I need to push beyond these self-imposed boundaries sometimes and reprioritize what's most important, see the bigger picture, and uh, connect with myself, ground with myself, and there's all kinds of ways to do that. We are told time and time again, meditate, be in the present moment, um, listen to podcasts, listen to music, do whatever you can to change a perception, to change a mindset, to change how you feel uh, by just changing it up. Because if you wake up and you stay in bed all day and it, you're depressed or anything like that, then you don't get a chance to expose yourself to what else is out there. So this might be a way to do it, and even if you're not in a depressed state or feeling bad, it can still be very helpful to move beyond what you know. Move beyond your network. Move beyond your circle of influence and get out there. I mean, this is why I tell some couples that you need to separate for a while. You need to get out of each other's spheres of influence, your, your circles that are uh, so close to each other that they overlap and when you get out of that and you get out of that space your mind starts to think differently you start to think and feel different because you're no longer in each other's space and what I mean by that is if you're in my space you're in my thoughts this could be the greatest thing ever hey you're in my thoughts that's the greatest thing ever and it affects my thoughts it alters my thinking it alters my neural pathways and makes me think in ways that I don't normally think when I'm alone. If suddenly I realized that I was alone, then I would think differently. And what would that be like? 
who am I when I think differently? Who am I when I'm alone? And that's connecting with yourself. That's grounding. And when you ground with yourself, you get to learn who you really are at the deepest level and what you really want in your life. And sometimes we need to be away from certain uh, environmental factors and people to figure out who you are so that you can make decisions from a more understanding place, an understanding of who you are and what you want in your life. So I kind of went in different places with this uh, first segment, but I'm going to change it up a little bit when we come back and talk about someone sent me an email about, uh, what are they, attracted to their boss or they were? There's something going on there that I'll get into and we'll figure it out, I hope. And uh, we'll be right back after this. I really hate to admit this, but one of the most confusing aspects of signing up for health insurance is figuring out what doctor I need and if they're in my network, do they take my insurance and will I be covered? I mean, there's so many questions I have and I've needed to find an easier way to make this easy. I need to find a way to make this easy and this is where ZocDoc comes in. I love this service. My girlfriend loves this service. She's the one who said, you've got to try this out because she actually punched it into the computer before I did. And uh, she said, I love it. This is it. This is so easy. And so I want to share this with you because it's an app. It's a free app that you can download. And it shows you the doctors who are patient reviewed. They take your insurance and they're available when you need them. And there's no question. There's no confusion. There's no mystery. And ZocDoc makes it easy to find quality doctors in your network and in your neighborhood. Plus, if you've ever seen any type of rating system for restaurants, they also have a rating system by uh, patients. So the patients go in and they rate their doctor, they rate the service, and what you end up with is an easier way to find the specialist and make sure that they're the right one for you. So ZocDoc has you covered. It's a mobile app. It's as easy as ordering from a restaurant. Go to ZocDoc.com forward slash brain and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's ZocDoc, Z-O-C-D-O-C.com forward slash brain. ZocDoc.com forward slash brain. Welcome back. I am going to jump right into this email and I'm going to change some of the details. So if somebody's listening or the person who wrote this is listening, uh, it's about you, (laughs) but it's not. It's going to be about someone in general. The person wrote, I want to thank you for your insights on this podcast. That part is true. (laughs) Thank you. And I've become more self-aware of my controlling tendencies. I wanted to ask you about a situation I went through with a particular person Uh, We worked together, he was fired, and I saw him on the day of his firing, and he can't ever hold a job down, and I said, you were fired because of your pride and your ego. He's also an addict, and I told him, you drown your emotions in drugs and alcohol. I said that in response of him saying that I let my emotions fly off the handle. Since then, he doesn't want to see me or contact me, and I look back on my comments, and I now realize that I wasn't very supportive and I might have made him feel bad about himself. I wanted him to do better for himself, to be healthy and stable and not enable his self-destructive behavior, but I might have been abusive instead. What was a better route for me to go instead so that I don't repeat this with someone I care about? All right, thanks for writing that, and I'm sorry you went through this, but it sounds like it maybe needed to happen so you can maybe understand something about yourself or a better approach and... I'll do my best here. I think that when someone has an addiction problem, that the addiction always, always wins. The addiction is always prevalent. It's always um, in their life as the number one priority. Even when they're sober and say, I've got to change. I've got to do something differently. Because 
that's why it's an addiction. It takes over any critical thinking because when they get into their addictive process, whatever their addiction is, the addiction takes over. This isn't with everyone. This isn't with every addiction. And I'm not saying that all addicts have no control. I'm saying that there are people where the addiction is number one. Even when they love people, they, lo- they have people in their life that they love, that they want to be with, that they don't want to lose. Even when there are close people in their life, the addiction can and often does win. And what that means is you can say, I'm leaving and I never want to talk to you again. And the addict will say, okay, okay, I'll stop. I'll stop what I'm doing. Please don't leave me. But what ends up happening is because it's an addiction, they haven't gotten help for it or they haven't figured out how to stop it, the addiction will win. Why does it win? Typically, now this is one reason, uh, because the addiction takes place of the emotions they don't want to feel. It kind of covers them. It stuffs them down. And if a person doesn't want to feel a certain emotional state, typically negative, if they don't want to feel a certain negative emotional state, an addiction will cover that. It will uh, override the emotions so that they don't have to feel the emotions. This is why some people drink. They don't want to feel sad. They don't want to think about the trauma or abuse in their past. That could be one thing. And so they drink so they don't have to feel that. But of course, the emotions are still there, so the addiction is still there. And when the emotions are healed, sometimes the addiction can go away. Sometimes they can't. You know, Sometimes it doesn't work. But when the emotions are healed, at least there's a chance. So let me come back to your question. You said, is there a better route for me to go instead so that I don't repeat this with someone I care about? Well, the first thing, or at least what you said was, you told him that you drown your emotions in drugs and alcohol. So that may be true. That may be 100% true. Do you need to repeat what he already knows? Or even if he doesn't know it, how is this helpful to him? And what was your purpose in telling him this? Because the typical addict, again, not all addicts, I'm trying to be very careful how I approach this, Addicts are people too. People get addicted to a lot of things. And almost every addict I know is super wonderful underneath. And when they're addicted, they're not usually wonderful. They're doing something else. They're they're acting a different way. But most of the addicts, or at least all of the ones that I've met, are just super nice people. It's just that addiction comes in and uh, takes over. And they're often nice people because they're covering or drowning, like you said, their emotions, their negative emotions. So if they don't want to feel something and they drown it, you're never going to see the bad side unless they're in their addictive process, unless they're taking or doing what they're addicted to. And so when they're not addicted or when they're not in that situation, they're not taking drugs or doing their addiction, they're probably very nice people. And so we love these people. They come into our lives and Maybe we don't know they have an addiction, but if they do, it's a Jekyll and Hyde thing. They're wonderful people to be around when they're not doing their addiction. Not all cases, but a lot of them and almost every one of them that I've ever met, they are usually very nice. So your question about could I have handled this differently is um, I think when you have an addict in your life, their addiction is their problem unless it's yours. What I mean by that is that when you have an addict in your life, they have to deal with their addiction in their own way unless it affects you and you have to deal with their addiction in the way that it affects you. So what this means is when there's an addict, you focus on yourself and how it affects you. If you say to them, you need to cure your addiction or I'm out of here, Yes, that could be something you could say, and I would support that. But what you're really saying is um, you're not going to stick around if they stay addicted, and then you have to follow through with that because that is refocusing your attention back on yourself and asking yourself, what do I need to do for me to, to take care of myself in this situation because the addiction will win. This is where I go, is that you need to know that the addiction will always win. 
And that's so hard to hear sometimes because we don't want the addiction to win. We want them to see us and love us and see that we're more important than what they're addicted to. But we are fighting a battle with some very dark demons sometimes inside the attic because the addict doesn't want to feel those things. They don't want to feel the emotions. They don't want to think the thoughts they have in a lot of cases. They don't want to have those thoughts. And if there's a chemical addiction, it might be different. But if they're uh, emotionally addicted, they don't want to feel those emotions. And because of that, they're going to drown whatever negative emotions come up so they don't have to deal with those emotions. And where does that leave you? Because they may act like uh, somebody you don't want to be around when they're addicted. And they may do things that you disagree with. They may do things outside your values, outside your boundaries. They may violate you in ways that you don't want to be violated in a lot of ways. And because of that, this is why you have to focus on yourself. So when you say you drown your emotions in drugs and alcohol, in order to change this, in order to come or approach this differently, you have to remember that their addiction is their issue. And whatever problem you have with their addiction is your problem. I know it sounds terrible when I say that, but your issue with someone else's issue is still your issue. That means you have to ask yourself, do I want to be around this person with this issue? That is the most basic fundamental concept of what I'm trying to speak about today is that when someone has an issue that affects you, you can do all you can to try to convince them to stop that, but it's not going to work. It'll probably work against you because it's their issue. So what do you do? You focus on yourself and you ask yourself, do I want to be around somebody with this issue? Because if their issue is affecting you, if their challenge makes it a challenge for you, it's not your job to tell them, hey, you need to stop that issue. It's your job to say, what do I need? Or ask yourself, what do I need for myself? And if that means telling the other person, because you have this addiction and because it's causing a problem in my life, I have to do X until you figure it out. What is X? I have to leave for a while. I have to leave permanently because you're this way. I have to stay with my parents. I have to stay with my sister. Whatever that means and whatever the situation is, the whole point is when you take care of yourself and you tell the other person, this is what I'm doing for me, instead of focusing on them saying, this is what you should do for you, it empowers them to make the right decision. And they may need help. They may need professional help to do what they need to do for themselves. But when you empower someone to make a decision, that's the kind of decision that usually sticks. If you convince someone to make a decision, then they're likely to fall back into old habits and old patterns. Because the addict will probably, some of them will find a way to get their addiction met in other ways. They'll change their addiction. They'll change the way they, it's all coping, right? They'll change the way they cope. And so that change may not be healthy. What I mean by that is you might say, you need to change who you are. You need to fix your problem. You need to stop drowning your emotions with alcohol or drugs or whatever. So fix yourself. And they may say, please don't leave me. Please don't leave. I will. I'll fix myself. And what they end up doing is hiding what they uh, don't want you to see. They don't want you to see what they're doing behind the scenes. They might hide alcohol or drugs, or they'll change what they're doing and find something else to be addicted to. Again, not all addicts, but uh, I'm putting this out there because when we try to change someone that has a big challenge like this, what we end up doing is creating a, a different mess. I mean, this is what often happens. We'll create a different mess thinking that it's going to be better, but we end up getting disappointed in the end. And this is why it's so important to enable someone in a good, positive way by empowering them with the capacity, with the ability to choose what they want for themselves. There's nothing more powerful than to say to someone, whatever you need to do for you is what you need to do. If you need to fix yourself, heal yourself, you need to work on yourself, that's great. Do that. But 
I'm not going to be in your presence while you do that because I can't um, accept this behavior in my life. That's powerful for you and for them. It's scary. It can be very scary for them because they typically want you in their life and if they can't stop but they still want you in their life, they have this battle inside and they hope you don't leave. They hope you just continue giving them a chance and being resilient and being tolerant which is why you have to refocus your attention on yourself and ask yourself the question, is this something I can continue allowing in my life? Is this something I can accept about them? Can I allow this person's addiction to be in my life and be okay with it? Can I be okay with this person's addiction? They may have adapted to it. They may have figured out that they can still survive, get along fine in life, but can you? Can you accept this, accept their decision to not change? Now, what can happen is they'll say they'll change and they won't. And I'm all about giving a person a chance to change because you can say, look, I can't be around your behavior if you're like this. So you have this issue that you need to deal with. You have this challenge and you know there are resources that you can reach out to and get the help you need. But um, until you're in a better space, I'm going to need to be away until you work on this stuff. And when that happens, they can either choose to change or not. And this is where the bottom has to fall out for some people. Some addicts have to have the bottom fall out for them or they'll never change. What is the bottom? Some of them have to reach so low that um, they experience so much loss that they finally make the choice to change. That's the incentive they needed to get to that point. And I also know there's some risk here because people who, who have addictions, they might be depressed. They might have suicidal thoughts that might be in their heads. And when we're around somebody like that, it can be challenging because now we don't want them to hurt themselves and we don't want them to do the addiction but if they don't do the addiction and they have no coping mechanisms, it's scary. This is why professionals need to be involved often and uh, AA and you know drug rehabilitation and things like that. But it's hard for us to be their helper. It's hard for us to be anything they need except a friend. And if we can't even do that because we can't be exposed to their toxic behavior when they're addicted, you know, if they do toxic behavior then we have to protect ourselves and we also have to let them know that um, they need to take care of themselves while we take care of ourselves. And if you're exposed to any of this behavior, you need to take care of yourself. Now, what this person wrote is, I might have been abusive. She said, I think it's a she, yeah. She said, I wasn't very supportive and I might have made him feel bad about himself. I wanted him to do better for himself, to be healthy and stable and not enable his self-destructive behavior. So she asked, what's a better route to go? Well, I don't think you can do anything about how he feels about himself because a lot of addicts will feel bad about themselves. That might already be there. There might be nothing that you can do about that already. Sure, we can do our best not to exacerbate anybody feeling bad about themselves, but um, there's not much you can do when somebody is already in that space. But yes, the way we do our best not to make someone feel bad about themselves is to again empower them with the ability to choose they you know this person can choose how he wants to live his life and he knows because you've told him at least what i'm telling you to tell him he he'll, he'll know that if he works on his addiction if he changes his behavior that there's a chance that you'll return come back into his life and that'll give him incentive to do that and sometimes that's what addicts need is incentive and unfortunately it's usually a negative incentive like if I don't heal and work on myself then I'll never have this person in my life again so that's good incentive in this case you said that he doesn't want you to contact him now this is a good thing for him to experience just like it is for you but I, I do believe that is him showing boundaries even though he, his boundaries may not be completely uh, self 
compassionate if you have boundaries and you tell people I'm going to drink or do any amount of drugs that I want. Not exactly the most self-compassionate thing to do because you're hurting yourself, you're hurting your body. But really what it comes down to is, is his choice. It's his choice to be the way he is, to do the things that he wants to do. And because it's his choice, you have an opportunity or an option to accept it or reject it. Now, this comes back to the four choices I talk about. You can accept and stay in the situation. You can reject it and stay in the situation. You can accept the situation as it is and leave, or you can reject and leave. And one of those works out better than the others. Usually you can accept a situation and leave or stay. That's usually the best uh, option. You can accept the situation and stay, which means you stop complaining about it. You stop thinking that it's a problem because you know this is how it is. I'm not saying that you should do this. I'm not saying that you're complaining about it. I'm saying that when you accept a situation for the way it is and a person, you accept the person for the way they are, then there's really nothing else to complain about because you've accepted it. You just accept them for who they are and know that there is baggage. And you're okay with the baggage. You adapt. Or you can accept who they are and walk away. No matter what, it's focused on you and what you need to do for you. And that's basically where I come back to every time. Is what do you need to do for you so you take your focus off of them. And you know, you asked, maybe this is abusive. You know, this is something that I need to look at in myself. And what we need to do is make sure that the focus is on us and not somebody else. And their problem is theirs, not ours. And when we make their problem our problem, yes we can become abusive. We can become hurtful. We can make them feel bad about themselves, absolutely, because we are trying to make choices for them. And when we try to make choices for someone else, that can feel like control. And uh, a lot of us don't want to be controlled. I don't want to be controlled. We want to feel like we have some autonomy and independence and making decisions for ourselves, even if it ticks someone off, even if somebody disagrees with our decisions. I want to be able to take a break during the day and go outside or just put my feet up without someone coming in and saying, you shouldn't take a break. You need to get back to work. I know some of you can resonate with that <laughs> right now. You can resonate with that. But I think that's a healthy way to treat someone else is to not try to force them or change them or tell them what they need to do. You just tell them what you can accept and what you can't accept. That doesn't mean what they're doing is bad or wrong. It just means that you won't be able to take it or handle it or be able to accept it in your life. So you're going to take care of yourself. And if they choose to change, great, we can have a conversation then. But until then, I need to take care of myself. So this is my answer to your question. The person who wrote, thank you so much for sharing all, sharing all this. Uh, what's a better route for me to go? Focus on yourself. Am I going to allow this in my life? Do I want to accept this? Because you said that, uh, or you told him, you drown your emotions in drugs and alcohol. And you said that in response to him saying that you let your emotions fly off the handle. So you're in the middle of probably a heated exchange. And because of that, you said things that were on your mind. And so you had every right to say what was on your mind. And this might be something that you couldn't have avoided. Maybe you just said it and it happened. And it's just one of those things because you were in a heated exchange. So that might not have been something that you could have changed. But obviously it was on your mind. For you to just spit that out. You drown your emotions in drugs and alcohol. That was on your mind for sure. How can you approach this differently? Return to yourself. Return to self-compassion, self-care. Ask yourself, what do I need to do for me? because this will allow you to stay out of his issues, out of anyone else's challenges, and empower you, quite frankly. Empower you to take care of yourself instead of relying on someone or waiting for someone else to change so that um, the relationship is better or the situation is different. So I hope I've given you enough to consider, to think about, and maybe a bit of understanding how an addiction can be a priority in someone's life and for anyone that hears that and they don't want to hear that, I know it's it's awful. It's it's very sad. I actually have an episode in Love and Abuse over at loveandabuse.com. Just type in the word addict in the search engine 
and you'll hear my thoughts on addiction in the abusive relationship and how that is number one. The addiction to the person who's addicted is number one, even when they themselves believe what they say about stopping it. I mean, I know addicts that have said, I will definitely stop. This is it. This is the last time. And then they're doing it again. They're addicted and they keep doing it. And it's often because there are emotions involved and coping mechanisms that haven't been healed, that haven't been worked on, that haven't been uh, thought through. And of course, there are chemical addictions where the body just craves it. They're usually intertwined, and I don't know enough about addiction to really give you a professional opinion on that, but I know enough about it having grown up around it and having known a lot of addicts. So thank you so much for writing this, and thank you for um, joining me for another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I'm so glad you're here. We will talk again very shortly. In fact, probably in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> I'll be right back with my thank yous and my goodbyes and my final words right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank the following patrons. They are Daisy, Winnie. Oh, Winnie's new. Good to have you on board, Winnie. Thank you for joining and supporting the show. I am grateful for you. Brad, always good to see your name. And, of course, Jamie and Holly and Nathan, Crystal, Angel, all of you wonderful financial backers of the show. I am so grateful and humbled by your monthly contributions. I appreciate you. Thank you, patrons. These are the patrons of the week. I read different names every week. And I want to let you know that there's an option for you if you want to be a patron, if you value the show like these people do and you want to give back, there's a way to do that. Go to moretob.com and uh, you have options there. Also, um, if you need a show on difficult relationships, I have another podcast. I just mentioned it called Love and Abuse over at loveandabuse.com. It is for learning about the difficult, controlling, manipulative relationships. Not that they have all those ingredients. Some of them do, and some of them just have certain ingredients that make the relationship difficult. But if you're having trouble navigating a difficult relationship in your life, head over to loveandabuse.com. There's also a program that I created, not a podcast, but an actual uh, course. I give you a step-by-step on how to not be a difficult person, how to be healed. It's called Healed being over at healedbeing.com and that is for the emotionally abusive person that wants to change. So if you find that you are the difficult person in the relationship and you need the specific steps to heal and deal with your coping mechanisms and work through your emotional triggers and just feel better and lighter inside yourself so that you don't feel the need to control or change other people, head over to healedbeing.com. And finally, thanks to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And for my final thoughts, I'm going to share with you a piece, or at least a part of a piece, that the New Yorker wrote back in 2003, and it has to do with somebody named Ken Baldwin. He went to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, like so many others have, because he was depressed and he didn't want to live life anymore. And uh, something I read has to do with what he said. And what he said was, uh, let me write, I'll read it here. I still see my hands coming off the railing. He said, as he crossed the cord in flight, it must be part of the bridge, Baldwin recalls, I instantly realized that everything in my life that I thought was unfixable was totally fixable, except for having just jumped. So he survived the fall. He tried to kill himself, and he survived the fall to talk about it. And what I read was about, I think it was 29. The the 29 people, I think it's 34 now, but the 29 people back then that survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge said they regretted it after they jumped. That is so powerful. That is so impactful, which is something important to remember If you've ever had thoughts that, I just need to get out of this life, I need to move on, then I want you to remember that 
if you haven't reached outside that box, if you haven't reached the threshold and pushed beyond it to expand yourself, to see what else is out there, that if you go too far, if you really make that decision, then what ends up happening is you lose out on the chance of learning that perhaps there's another way. There's, there's another way to look at things. There's another perspective you can have. And life doesn't have to look like the way it looks. We don't have to perceive it the way it is. And sometimes we have to change things in our life so that we aren't so miserable. Because <laughs> we can be miserable from circumstances and people and jobs and things that happen to us. And when they do, we think there's only one way and there's a lot of ways. Just like Ken Baldwin said, that, you know, as soon as he jumped, he regretted it. I could have fixed those things, but he was so trapped in that small box that his threshold was almost death. And I'm glad it wasn't. And I hope it's not for you. If, if you ever think like this, maybe this episode isn't for you. Maybe this is for someone else that you can share it with. But I wanted to talk about this because if those feelings do come over you at any time, there's no turning back if you go too far. And imagine if you go too far and you realize you can't turn back. Those 29 people that jumped off the bridge and survived, they all regretted it. They all had a new perception, a new realization because they went a little too far, but it might have been too late for them and it wasn't. And that's not a road that we want to travel, especially if there's a new life for us in this life. If there's a new way of looking at things, there's a new path to take. And I'm going to generalize this, not about suicide, but about anything in your life. I remember having the crappiest job in the world, <laughs> in my world, probably not your world, but in my world, it was the worst job. It gave me headaches, like very harsh headaches every day, but I had to do it because I believed that it's important to continue working no matter what. And this is the only job that I can get. You know, I had these beliefs that if I quit this job, I'm not going to have any money. I'm going to starve. And some of that may be true, but is it worth giving up my health? Is it worth giving up everything else in life just to make money for the next day or the next week? I finally stopped working at that job. I think I got fired <laughs> and I got demoted and um, I had less pay. So I actually went down a notch, but it raised my happiness so much. And it made me think that this isn't the way it has to be. I can actually make a choice. I have choices. I just was in this box thinking, this is what I have to do. No, this isn't what you have to do. I was thinking that this is the only way to make money. No, it's not. This is the only place I should be because they hired me and I'm committed and I'm loyal. No, you don't have to be. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to be loyal, yes, but to a job that's destroying you? How about to a relationship that's destroying you? You don't have to be loyal to something that destroys you. You can move on, you can move forward, you can move out of it and find something else. And I know that's not always easy. It's not always easy to find something else and change things in your life. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you are stuck. This is why it's important to start planning ahead and start thinking about what could change that might change everything. What thought could you have that might change your reality? What direction could you go that might change things for you in your life today? There are ways to think, there are things to do, there are places to see and people to meet and so much more that the world offers that are outside our typical box, our network, our friends, our environment, our job, that if we don't think are there, we're not going to go for it and we're going to think that this is all there is. Remember that um, quote in that movie? Is this all there is? <laughs> I don't remember the movie. I, maybe it's not a real quote. <laughs> but that's what I felt in the past. You know, is this all there is? Is this all there is to life? Oh, no. There's a lot more. And sometimes we just have to find it. Sometimes we have to search for it. Sometimes we have to climb that mountain. And sometimes we just have to keep an open mind because that's how we step into our power and realize that there's so much more 
that this life offers, that we can create the life we want and always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure and above all. And this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing. Amazing.